Hello, everyone. My name is David Finlayson with Chesapeake Technology. And uh, today we're going to talk about gain settings in SideScan. SonarWiz has a bunch of these built in, and sometimes it's kind of a mystery exactly which ones you should use and when. So we're going to dig down into those. At a fairly deep level, um, I'm going to explain how they work, try to show you some graphs of the math that is going on, and then give you some recommendations for when uh, you should use it or not. This is a bit of an intermediate talk. I'm not going to talk about uh, using side scan or importing files or any of that. Uh, we have other webinars for that. And the talk will take about 45 to 50 minutes for me to get through everything I have. Without further ado, let me get started. So in today's agenda, we're going to talk about the sonar equation, which if you've had some uh, college level instruction in acoustics, you'll get to hear about this all the time. Uh, but it's it pretty much explains what gain processing is trying to do. Then I'll show you the gain dialog in SonarWiz and the different options and algorithms that we have available to you. And then I'm going to dive down into each one. Uh, user gain controls, the TVG modes, automatic gain control, auto TVG, beam angle correction, and then finally EGN. And then I've got a couple summary slides that give my recommendations for what you should use. So to start with, uh, side scan signal processing is all about compensating for the acoustic waves as they propagate through the seafloor. Um, they are spreading out and the energy is being absorbed. So whatever energy is being put into the water by your transducer is spreading out. And some of that is uh, spread out. Initially, it's spherical as it comes away from the transducer. And then when it hits the sea surface or the sea floor, it starts to spread spherically as shown in this diagram here. How that affects us in side scan is that we tend to see a uh, pattern that looks like this, where you've got the nadir stripe down here in the center, and then it's, it's fairly strong signal. And then as the range increases, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker until finally it ex extinguishes. We don't see any more data. So this across track correction, is what our gain algorithms are trying to correct for. They're trying to make this data set here look like this one. So here's another example of a mosaic before gains have been applied. And you know you can see there's stripes in here. It gets fades out, it fades in. We wanna to try to make this even illumination across the whole seafloor so that the end result looks like this. And uh, that's the purpose of this talk, to talk about what those algorithms are available to you. Now, let's talk about the sonar equation. So the sonar equation is kind of a way of expressing how uh, the energy moves through the system from the transducer down to the seafloor, back to the transducer and through all the processing. You can break it up into these basic parts here. Uh, you've got a signal. That's what we generate with our transducer. We have to subtract off the noise. Then we add a gain to that which is what our talk today is about. And if that is sufficiently loud enough, then we will see a, a signal. So here on the left-hand side, uh, we have an unprocessed side scan file. There's the nadir. Here where it's bright and we can see targets, we have exceeded the threshold. We're able to get good quality data. But as we get further and further away, the gains aren't enough. There are no gains yet. Um, and we start to lose the seafloor. We don't see anything. Can we come up with a gain that makes the data look like this? Now, what the sonar equation does is it breaks this into the parts that we are fixing. So first we have the source level. That's how loud our transducer is. Then we have transmission losses uh, from the transducer down to the seafloor and back again. It's a two-way trip. So that's why we multiply it by two here. Then there's the inherent strength of the target. What are we bouncing it off of? Uh, is it sand? Is it mud? Is it a rock? Is it a target like a, a sunken ship or ex unexploded ordnance? That's what the target strength refers to. Then what we have to subtract from this signal is the noise that's in the water column. There's ambient noise in the sea, in the sea itself. Um, I have some interesting stories of places where I worked uh, where the noise was so strong we couldn't get anything on the seafloor. And then there's also self noise. So many of you have experienced when you're on a like a big ship and the transducers aren't mounted in the correct location, then uh, that noise can actually reduce the performance of your sonar. The cavitation coming over the transducers can really affect how uh, your data looks. The 
Next step here is the directivity index, and I'll have to show you a picture of what that is. But when engineers design a transducer, they design it so that it is only enhancing uh, noise, it's only listening in certain directions, and it tries to not listen to directions that we're not interested in. And that angular dependence is called the directivity pattern of the sonar, the beam pattern of the sonar. And that has a big effect on what our data looks like. And then finally, we have processing gains. That's the part that SonarWiz is adding. We're trying to compensate for all of these effects so that we get a signal that's above the threshold of detection. Now, uh, the first term here, this transmission loss, is uh, represented by basically this simple time varying gain uh, law. And the first part here, this 20 log of the range, R's range here, is uh, representing how energy dissipates in, in a sphere. As the range gets further, the sphere gets larger, and uh, basically we're it's an R squared problem, so you take the two and put it up here, so it'd be R cubed, or squared, sorry. And that says that the further away we are, the bigger that sphere is, the less energy we have. The second part is absorption. The seawater itself absorbs energy in the water, and it does it because of uh, the mag or magnesium sulfate. When you have frequencies below 100 kilohertz, uh, there's relaxation of boric acid when you have frequencies below one kilohertz. And then you have the pure viscosity of water also uh, absorbs energy. And we represent that phenomenon with an absorption coefficient here times a range. And usually this thing is expressed in uh, decibels per meter or decibels per kilometer. So the further away you are, the more absorption there is. Now on this graph over here, you can see that um, this is highly frequency dependent. So each one of these lines, on the left-hand side, we have the transmission loss. It's a negative value, so we're subtracting from our signal. And here's the range. Now for side scan, we're usually in the sub, uh, this is one kilometer right here. So we're usually down here in the 100 meter area. So in, what we can see is that the lower or the higher the frequency, the more this transmission loss is. And that's partly because, you know, we know this intuitively, the, the higher the frequency, if you have an 800 kilohertz sonar, you get a lot less range out of that than you do with a, with a lower frequency, 100 kilohertz or less. So this is a uh, law that we use to represent transmission loss. The next thing that has to do with our, our signal is the target strength. Um, we're not going to go into this too much today, but it's really a factor of three things. The local geometry, are you bouncing off a surface that's pointed towards the transducer or away from it? Um, it's the roughness of the surface that you're hitting. If you're bouncing off of something smooth, then most of the, the energy is gonna bounce away from the transducer. But if you're bouncing off a of gravel or something that's really rough, a lot more energy comes back towards the transducer. It makes a brighter signal. And then finally, there's this intrinsic property of the seafloor itself is What's the impedance of that seafloor? Is it something that's very hard that's gonna bounce off like concrete, or is it something very soft like silts and sands? That All of that has to do uh, with our target strength. Noise, there's really two types of noise that affect sonar reception. You have external ambient noises. These would be things that are random in nature, shipping traffic. Um, I mentioned that I had done a survey in uh, once where we were inside of a harbor and we brought our sonar in and we could not get a seafloor at all. When we went outside the harbor, everything was working just fine. And it turned out we, we came back and we brought a camera and we looked down at the seabed inside the harbor and it was completely covered with snapping shrimp. They were so loud that it completely swamped our sonar. That was That's really beyond our ability to control this. The only thing you can do is maximize the signal to noise ratio. You can turn the volume up on your sonar and ping as loud as possible. Um, you can change the type of sonar. You can go away from continuous wave sonars to something like a chirp that does a better job of penetrating through noise. Um, and finally, you have a little control. You know, engineers have a control over the directional, the directionality of the transducers to try to ignore parts of the C, you know, the the C noise that we're not interested in listening to. 
don't listen to directions we don't care about. In case of side scans, um, they tend to, to try to shield the sea surface. We don't want to listen to any noise that's coming off the sea surface. The other thing is self noise. Um, these are things that you can usually identify with some control. So if you have a mount that is wiggling or you're getting cavitation over your sonars or things like that, these are stuff that you can control. Um, but we're not going to go into that too much today. But in any case, uh, our game processing has to be able to compensate for these things. Finally, there's uh, directivity. And a transducer has two different directivities. There, there is the transmit, so when you're sending energy out of the transducer, and then there's on reception. Um, where, what are we listening to? Here's an example of a, this is a simulator I, I do in my classes where I show a, a row of transducers here. And the color here represents the strength of the signal coming out. It's a, this is a positive or a transmit lobe. And what I was showing here, when you have a long array like this, there is a lobe here down at the bottom that is very strong. And then off to the side, you have side lobes, and they're, they're much weaker than the main lobe here. And they can be made weaker still by applying other filters and things like that. But uh, the point of this slide is that if whether we're transmitting or listening, this array has been designed to primarily listen in this direction, in this lobe here. And you may have seen diagrams that look like this. Uh, this is a directivity diagram of a transducer. So here's the main lobe, and then you've got the side lobes coming off the side. So sound that comes from this direction, transmit or receive, will be enhanced on this array rather than sounds coming from the other sides. Unfortunately, on this one, there are some strong side lobes here. Um, so unwanted sound can get into our signal this way. You'll sometimes see in side scan a, a side lobe can pick up the sea surface, and you'll see an imprint of the sea surface waves over the top of your seabed. That's partly what's happening is that uh, data is getting into your side lobes. And uh, our gain law has to be able to compensate for the directional changes that happen here. So, what does Sonar was provide to you? Um, we have, I think, eight different gain algorithms and filters in SonarWiz. They're usually found, all of them are found on the settings menu. Um, I have a, this is a picture of one where I turned everything on and I've got all the dials and knobs and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So we have conventional TVGs, we have empirical gain normalization, we have two statistical modes, the uh, automatic gain control and aut automatic time varying gain beam angle correction, and then we have two filters, which aren't really gains per se, but they're part of this uh, dialogue. I'm not gonna talk about them too much today, but they're the D-Stripe filter and the Nader filter. They're all, all placed here. And just one last word before I kind of jump into the individual um, algorithms and what they do. Um, there is no free lunch in engineering. So this is an example here of a problem that happens when you gain up data. So in this example, there's four fish across the top and we've got a transducer here and it pings. Now each one of these fish is exactly the same. They're totally identical. But because the sound is further and further and further away and has further to travel, it's spread out, it's been absorbed. And you can see that the return from each one of those fish gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Now the purpose of our gain processing is to try to, here's our gain curve here. We're gonna to try to ramp up these fish further away from the transducer so that they all look about the same. This is very equivalent to what we're doing in side scan. And here you can see we've now managed to make each one of these fish echoes look about the same. But notice we've also enhanced the noise. So, so changing the gains on the far field here, doesn't make that fish in the far field stand out any better from the noise. It doesn't change the signal to noise ratio. It just uh, makes it louder. So be careful uh, not to overgain things because what you'll wind up seeing is just noise. It really does matter um, what gain algorithms you choose. So I have the same survey processed with three different gain algorithms in SonarWiz. The first one here on the left is AGC. 
And here you can barely see geology at all. The gain algorithm is not designed to enhance geology, and so we don't see any if we zoom out. Auto TVG does show a little bit of geology, but only locally. You can see that there's like this lag or time history uh, along each line, but so it kind of acts more like an edge detection filter. You can see that geology changed here, but everything is mostly gray in the background. If we could zoom in on any one of these sections, you would get a nice picture of the data uh, in that local area. But when you zoom way out like we are here, uh, it's hard to compare a pixel from this part of the diagram down in the south end to a pixel in the north end. And then we have EGN over here, which was designed for this. So here the geology pops out. You can see uh, uh, there's a consistency in, along this rock reef where the, the samples are all colored the same value. And then when you get into the sandy section or the muddy sections, it's dark. And that that's consistent for the whole mosaic. So each one of these algorithms has a different purpose. And clearly for a big mosaic like this, EGN is the one you want to use. Uh, these other two algorithms, auto, AGC and AutoTVG, are not good at doing mosaics. And so you want to make sure you're using the right algorithm for the right purpose. So let's start with time varying gain. So again, we've already seen this slide, but time varying gain can be represented by uh, transmission loss, which is a function of spherical spreading, which is 20 log times the radius, plus an absorption times the radius. And the way SonarWiz represents this is in our uh, user gain control TBG mode. So here you've got your two plots of your gain. It's a decibels here on the left-hand side on the vertical axes, and then time on the right-hand side, and this is in milliseconds. And here's the exact formula uh, right here. Now, the only hard part, so you've got 20 times the log of the range times the absorption coefficient here times the range, plus uh, we add a little uh, static offsets. You can raise or lower the brightness of a line just by typing it in here. Now, the tricky part, um, for time varying gain is that you need to know what this absorption coefficient is, this alpha value. And this is actually a really complicated equation. It's a function of depth, salinity, water temperature, and sonar frequency. And typically that, that is not something you know um, when you're doing a side scan survey. So we do have a little button here on the dialog that allows you to compute what that absorption coefficient is based on the salinity of the water. So if you can type in the salinity of the water in parts per million, then SonarWiz will look at your files, look, we know what the water temperature is, we know what the sonar frequency is, and we assume that the depth is uh, zero, so this is really the absorption coefficient at the surface, but it allows us to kind of substitute in a value in here, which is a good first approximation for this curve. So let's uh, take a look at it in SonarWiz. So I've loaded up um, seven lines here, and we're just gonna take a look at this first one. And right now uh, I've imported the lines and I've done all the navigation adjustments that I want to do to them. We're just focusing on the curves uh, for gains. And the way you get to those, uh, so here's our line. You can select the line, and right click it and then open settings. And here are uh, the lines or the uh, different gain formula we have. We got beam angle correction, AGC, auto TVG, et cetera. Now the first one we're gonna look at is TVG. So I'm gonna enable user gain control and I wanna click the TVG mode. And I've already done this once when I made the screenshot, but what I would do is uh, say type in the salinity and uh, PSUs then you click autofill and it computes what this algor or what the absorption coefficient is based on our data and the frequency of our sonar system. So then uh, we've got that turned on and we can click apply or okay. And then we can see uh, how that gain has been applied. And it, what it did, if we turn on its neighbor here, it's got one that's not corrected two things we can see about this. Uh, first, 
we've got our uh, histograms are changing. So the gain is changing the amplitude values of the line that we applied it to, and it's different than the one uh, that we applied here. We can see that as two different histograms here. So uh, for the rest of this talk, in order to make this easy to read, I'm gonna assign different histograms to uh, each one. So each line will get its own histogram. But now we can see that the one where we applied time varying gain on the left here, it does a really good job uh, once you get past the nadir. It, it really, it gains up the side. It does a good job of preserving the geology um, compared to the, the line that has no correction on it at all. Um, the other thing you can do with uh, TVG is uh, if you wanna play around with say the nadir or whatever, you can copy this curve into a linear mode. So we'll copy that. And the way you do that is you click this button here. You say how many nodes you wanna get. The default is 16. And now the curve has been put into a place where we can adjust it. We can play around uh, by just grabbing these nodes with the mouse. And we perhaps we can try to fix this area in the center, which uh, I'm gonna talk about in a moment. We hit apply here. Can't quite get it right. So it's a little bit tricky to manually fix this. So we know that the outside part looks pretty good, but it's hard to get this area in here towards the nadir exactly gained right. That's an interesting question. Why is it even there in the first place? And the reason is that whatever's causing the nadir to be dark here in the center on this track line is not modeled by spherical spreading and absorption. There's something else going on. I suspect, I don't know exactly, but I think it's probably the directivity of the sonar, that the, the manufacturer of the sonar doesn't want, uh, knows that the data in the nadir is not very good and is trying to turn down the volume of sound coming from that direction. So that kind of raises, are there statistical ways we can do the same processing rather than, so this, this mode of TBG doesn't know anything about our sonar except the frequency that we put in here for the uh, absorption. Otherwise, it's just a law you could look up in a textbook and it applies to every single sonar on the planet. There's nothing special about the statistics of this that's unique to our sonar system. Um, so let's go back to our presentation here. Um, when, is, when should you use TVG? Well, it's good at correcting for spreading and absorption losses. That's what we saw on the outside. It's safe to use with all the other algorithms because the same laws applied to every single ping you can apply it uh, when you're doing mosaics or you can do it when you're doing target detection. And uh, it is suitable for regional mosaics, but you will wind up with areas of the sonar signal, signal that are not compensated for. Anything that's not well modeled by absorption or spreading doesn't get fixed using TVG. So it performs poorly at nadir and it does not adapt to your sonar or the environment that you're working in. So let's look at the next one. The next one is automatic gain control. And the, this algorithm is statistical. So it works with your ping data and it tries to come up with a curve based on your sonar and your data that compensates for uh, the across track changes in, in color that we're seeing in our file. So to kind of illustrate how this works, um, I have a single ping here. So I've got the slant range plot out of the bottom on the horizontal axes, and I have a intensity on the vertical axis. So that's the amplitude or the brightness. And this is just uh, some data I made up in Excel. But what I did is I put a curve in here and I put a little noise on top of it. Now with AGC, you've got two sliders basically. One determines how wide uh, a moving in window is gonna be. And the other one determines what the target intensity is gonna be. So I've set the target intensity here for 15. That's just an arbitrary value. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move a moving average over the top of our raw data and kind of come up with this orange curve. It's a smooth version of our data. Then the next thing we do is we compute the difference between our target intensity and our smoothed curve. So you can see the, that's what these arrows represent. So we've got our smoothed curve and our target intensity. And then finally, 
we subtract that smooth that delta from the raw data and that leaves us with a curve that's basically a uh, high pass filter. It's allowing the high frequency data to come through and that low big curve has been removed and now it's flattened like this. So the two things you control on uh, AGC, so here's AGC on our dialog, you control the resolution and the intensity. And I, I wish these names were a little different, but resolution would be the width of our low pass filter. And it ranges from 1% of the swath width to 100% of the swath width. So you set what that that window is. And I like something, you know, say around 15 or 20. So that would be 15% of the swath width right here. Now the intensity value uh, relates to this target. So we want a target that is you know, 15% of the curve, it's 15% of the maximum here. So that would be right around the, I don't know, it's right around the peak there. So if we apply this to our line, now we can see what AGC has done. Um, it does a good, it does a very good job of flattening this uh, this curve here. So as it goes across the uh, track line, it's gaining up the areas that are on the outside. It's doing, it's gaining these areas that have gotten really dark are getting pumped up and areas that are too bright get reduced. So you wind up with a very even uh, a dynamic range across the swath like this. Now where the problems come up uh, with AGC is when you get on to geology, you can see it tends to, bright areas in the geology also get tamped down and dark areas in the geology get ramped up. It keeps pushing things towards that target intensity. So this has both good effects and bad effects. The good part of this is if you have weather noise, like you have pitch or uh, roll artifacts in your data, this, this doesn't really have it too much then AGC is absolutely superb at removing that noise because it always, it tries to remove the noise or it moves the intensity up or down so that the whole line is uniform. Uh, the downside to this is that geology gets completely removed. It's really hard to see geology. We saw that on that slide in the beginning where the, it just looked like a big gray mess. So uh, what, what AGC is really best at is if you have a small target, the relative dynamic range is very good. So you can see small targets very well and you don't get a lot of artifacts in here. So, but if we wanna make a great big mosaic, um, it has a tendency to remove the geology. So here is an example where I applied AGC to the entire data set. And there's a couple of things to point out. The first one is that each line, basically every single ping gets its own AGC correction. And so um, even though the target value is the same, the lines tend to have different uh, looks to them. Like here's, here's one line that was split into a small section and then a large section. Um, these two lines don't match exactly because of the averaging algorithm in here. The target intensity of this track line is different than the target intensity here because the histograms of these two lines aren't exactly the same. So uh, when should you use it? it is absolutely the best algorithm in SonarWiz for removing pitch and roll artifacts. If you've got a bad data set where you're out with weather, AGC is superb for that. And it is very good at correcting local areas. So if you're interested in targets that are smaller than a few, you know, say you're looking at tires or unexploded ordnance or something small, then uh, AGC works really well. But it does remove regional geology. You can see it's kind of damped down the difference here. Line-to-line um, -line changes are possible, and I would not recommend it with large mosaics. I wanted to talk about AGC first because the next one, Auto TVG, is sort of a combination of AGC with a little bit of memory to it. So in this one, we've got the same diagram again. We've got a slant range here on the bottom, and we've got intensity across the top. And what Auto TVG does is it breaks the 
line into 32 boxes or bins. So I tried to represent them here. I might have even gotten 32 of them on there. Each one of these bins is going to compute a mean value for that bin, which I'll try to represent with my line again. And then it computes the delta. So at this point, we're exactly the same as AGC. So they are exactly the same at this point. Now where it's different is that AGC also has a little bit of history to it, or hysteresis. So instead of just looking at the single ping that we're on, like AGC does, it has each one of these 32 bins has a history. It remembers what the value of the correction was over time. I'm not sure exactly how long uh, that that time is. Uh, it's using a uh, IIR filter, or, which I didn't have time to actually figure out in our code what the what the memory is, but it tends to be about um, I don't know 200, maybe 300 pings or so. There's still a little bit of history. So it computes the delta for this box, and then maybe that's this box here, and then it looks at all the other deltas, and it, there's a distance weighted value that's put in there. So it looks at all those previous values. The further away they are, the less weight they have. And the result then is incorrected. So let's look at how this looks um, here. So auto TVG is here. So we're going to remove AGC and we're going to apply auto TVG. And we've got two different, or basically a port and a starboard target intensity. So auto TVG lets you configure what that target intensity is going to be, but it doesn't allow you to change what the, uh, the length of the memory is. That might be a nice feature to add. Now, I find that auto TVG does a really good job uh, at highlighting small targets. I think that's it's it's really good at this. Like with these uh, rocks really pop out with Auto TVG. So because the the uh, a long track distance here is pretty small, it's maybe less than a couple hundred pings. Then that history that the TVG curve has doesn't seem to erase the geology, or you get a nice pop when it switches from the soft sediments to the uh, coarser sediments that have the uh, ripples in them. And then our targets kind of really pop out with this thing. So, and compared to the raw unfiltered data or the uncorrected data, it's it's done a good job of removing the uh, across track variation. So it's it's gained up here. It does an okay job um, over small geological changes like we see in this data set. But uh, that history can be a problem. If we go back to this slide here, you can kind of see the history or the, as we switched geology here from a, from a soft sediment to a hard sediment, you see these white streaks um, right, right here. So as, the, as it switches direction, it goes in the long track direction here. You can kind of see these streaks. And what's happening there, that's this memory showing up um, here. That's this slowly being averaged in. But the average has changed because we've jumped off the geology. We've walked, we're not on a rocky reef anymore. We're on sand or vice versa. And so the correction, that history of changes is remembered. And it's, um, it's not updating fast enough is the problem. So. When should you use auto TVG? I think it's excellent for target detection. If this is your goal for your mission, then I would use auto TVG as a start. It works really well in homogeneous terrain. So if you've got just sand or just rocks, it works great. It tends to remove geology over time. Um, it works okay for small changes. Like these lines don't look too bad, actually. You can still see the, uh, the distinct difference between the rocky stuff and the soft stuff. I wouldn't use it with large mosaics though because of the problem it has each you know the memory is only a couple hundred pings or so and each line tends to look different so i've colored this in a way where it's uniformly colored but like this, this little short chunky line is colored different than the longer version of it when i broke it in half so you will see line to line differences it's not a great uh gain algorithm for 
mosaics. Beam angle correction. Now, beam angle correction is the first one of the algorithms we've talked about that works in uh, angular space instead of range. So here is our simulated data on the left. This is the same plot we've been looking at over and over again. So we've got intensity versus range. Now, if I, I take this data and I plot it instead as angle, where zero is directly be below the transducer, and this is where we're spreading out, where 90 degrees would be horizontal. So here's the data getting further and further out. What you'll notice is that most of the data is out here in the 60 to 80 degrees area for side scan. That's where most of our data is. But there's, because the angles are changing really fast, if this were our transducer at the top and the angles are spreading out this way, you get a lot of oversampling towards the nadir here. Between zero and 40 degrees, it's only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points. That's this area right in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to there. So where beam angle correction is superb is in correcting for um, the nadir area. And I'll sh show you how it works. So, so we're gonna work with this plot over here by angle. Uh, it's kind of similar to AGC in this respect. So what it does is it creates a curve or a spline and it fits that spline through the angular curve and what it does is it takes a section of data so you say how many pings you want to grab so in this case i took 255 pings i plotted them all out and i fit a spline through that then i calculate the difference and now i have a delta that i can go back and apply to the entire uh, section this whole 255 section then I move the section. I move it another 255 pings. There's a little overlap here because we want to blend these two sections together. And then I do the whole thing again. I do another 255 pings and I keep going. So this one, you just keep jumping down the line in 255 degree pings with a little bit of overlap between those sections. So let's take a look at that. So if you right click here, and you go to settings, beam angle correction is here, and you have two uh, settings here. The first is how big the window is gonna be. That's how big this box is. That's this part. How many pings are we gonna take? And it ranges from, um, you can have, I guess the minimum amount. Here, I gotta slide this over, it won't let me. There we go, the minimum value you could have is three pings. So your box has to be at least three pings across. I recommend actually setting it at its maximum if you've got the time to do it. Um, 255 pings, and then how much overlap do you want in pings? 22, 20, 50? I'm not sure what the best value is, but let's just say 20 for this example. So I've got 255, uh, 255, uh, is my the number of pings I'm going to average and then the overlap is 20. You hit apply here. Now the first thing you'll notice about beam angle correction is it's making a lot of loops over the data. It has to each section it's got to tally up all the values and uh, here we can you can kind of see where the sections are. This is my complaint about beam angle correction. So this means that we if we make the overlap too little if we made it down here to two. So now we have basically no overlap at all. We'll actually be able to see the little 255 ping sections in here. So here's each section. You can kind of see the value, right? There's the a border, there's a border, there's a border, there's a border. So it's walking its way down. Um, if we increase this to its maximum, those mostly go away. Let's apply that. But this is gonna take uh, quite a bit longer. Now inside one of these sections, what beam angle correction does better than any other algorithm in SonarWiz, so it's done now, is it, it really does a good job in the nadir area. So if, if you're trying to clean up a bad nadir, beam angle correction is the best. 
And it's because it's so oversampled uh, towards the inside of the track lines. Um, but here I've got 255 pings, I've got maximum overlap of 100. And now uh, because those there's so much overlap, you don't see the boundaries so much between the different uh, sections. And it actually looks pretty good. Um, I think it's, it's really decent. You get nice definition on targets. If you go down here and look at this target, it's very good. It's similar to auto TVG, um, but it's better than auto TVG at pulling out uh, the nader. So my chief complaint with it is that it's really slow because it, uh, it's computationally intensive. So superb at removing nader artifacts. I think it's the best at that. It works best in homogeneous environments. It's really similar to auto TVG in that respect. Um, it's very sensitive to settings. So if you get those settings wrong, you'll actually see the little boxes as it's jumping down the line. And I just showed you how that worked. Again, I don't think you should use it for large mosaics because one box over here on sand is not gonna be the same as a box put over the top of a rocky area. And the main complaint with it though, is that it's very slow to apply to large data sets. So uh, I think in terms of target definition, it certainly performs as well as auto TVG and it does better at nadir. So if you've got the patience to let the thing go through its whole uh, work, this, this might actually be one of our best algorithms for doing um, target detection. But uh, I don't think it's a great algorithm for doing mosaics. So let's talk about empirical gain normalization. Now, when you plot side scan data, now here I've got four track lines laid on top of each other. What we usually want to do in the areas where they overlap is you average the values together. And the reason that you average them is you don't want to see artifacts between the two different data sets. There's an edge here at the, at the far side. There's an edge here. We don't want to see that. So if you had enough data, if you packed enough data sets down there, you could average it away. And the stuff that stayed the same, the geology that was underneath your data survey would stay the same. The naders would move around as you surveyed in different places. And if you had enough data and enough overlap, you could eventually remove most of the nader artifacts. Now that's probably never practical except in really small areas. But the idea is that we can use averaging to get rid of the artifacts and just leave the geology that's underneath. And that's what happens when we plot amplitude spatially. But what if what we were interested in was the artifacts and not the geology? We could take the same data that's plotted in this plot, and if we plot it in a different way where the artifacts stay the same and the geology gets averaged out, then we could identify where the artifacts are in our data and remove them. And that's exactly what we've done in a plot like this. So this is a plot of a transducer beam uh, amplitude. So we took, we took the same exact data that you're seeing here from the seafloor, and instead of plotting it uh, in latitude and longitude, we plot it in terms of its depth relative to the transducer. So in this case, the transducer is at zero, zero, and this is uh, to the, this would be to the left or port side of the transducer, and this is to the starboard side of the transducer, and this is range away from the transducer. So if you stack hundreds of thousands of pings on top of each other, you can build a uh, empirical gain or an empirical directivity index. If you remember back to that slide I showed you where the beams are actually coming out of the, the data or out of the transducer and I showed you what that looked like. Here we've inverted that from actual ground returns. We were looking at the amplitude that was collected on the seafloor, but we've plotted them in a different way. And by averaging them out, we got rid of the geology that's been averaged away. And what we're left with are the artifacts because every single ping that is in this zone here shows a beam artifact. Every ping that's down here directly beneath the nadir has an artifact in it. And we can see the shading that was designed in to try to reduce uh, artifacts off to the direct, because this is a side scan, this is a interferometric system. 
it's trying to remove data from the nadir uh, so it's shaded a little and you can see the beams coming out here and uh, this is the wide lobe of a side scan transducer now that we know what the amplitudes are we can look at this plot and normalize it we know we need to up gain areas in this zone or even small little areas in here need to have different gains applied to them than right here close to the transducer. And so what we do is we go back to the raw data and we can start with something that looks like this. Uh, this is raw data. We apply that beam correction and you can almost get rid of the artifacts in between the lines. You can still see the nadirs here, that's hard to get rid of, but it does an excellent job at preserving the geology and uh, removing artifacts. And because we're applying the same gain curve to the entire data set, um, we're correcting the artifacts from the transducer. Uh, we don't have any of the problems that auto TVG and beam angle correction and AGC have where they erase the geology. So let's take a look at uh, how that works. So, uh, the more data you put into, so basically, we, we have to work in two steps. We have to create a table. So I'm gonna take beaming correction off and I'm gonna turn on EGN here. The first step is to build a table. So we're gonna use all the data sets here and we're gonna create a beam angle table. That's this thing. So we're creating this right now. So we take all the data sets in our uh, survey and we feed them in. And then we can apply that table to our data. Now the same table can be applied to each track line or you can create new, uh, there's another way to do this um, that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So this correction here is extremely good at preserving the geology. So here we can see the the uh, rocky areas, or the I guess in this case it's ripples. If we zoom in on this, you can see the sand ripples here, and you can see uh, how the geology is actually changing around these small targets because of currents. You know, you can actually see stuff drifting off of rocky reefs. Um, small subtle changes are actually really uh, obvious. And what's interesting about EGN is it's not only good here, it's good for the whole survey. So if we turn on all of the track lines and we apply EGN to all of them, which I'm just gonna use make others like this. So we'll select this, go to make others like this, and we'll just copy uh, everything. While I'm talking, we'll let this process. But what EGN is doing is it, it's got, there's one table for the entire survey. So each track line gets corrected the same way. And the result uh, tends to be very uniform. So even though we've got this small track line here next to this guy, which really gave the statistical um, algorithms a lot of problems, even though it's going a different direction, uh, it tends to look really decent. And if right now I've got the overlap mode set to uh, cover up, so I'm not allowing it to blend the edges at all. If you do do that, um, it tends to do a really good job of removing the artifacts. You can still kind of see them here, but overall the entire geological um, presentation, the entire mosaic is corrected the same way. And so it, it works really well. One area uh, that has been requested a lot, a lot of clients uh, have found that rather than applying a single EGN table for the entire survey, they would prefer to have a single EGN table per line. And we recently added that ability. So if you go to settings here, you can go to build EGN table, and there's a new checkbox here if you haven't used this before, and it says create uh, one per file. And what that will do is, uh, it's sort of like a compromise between EGN and beam angle correction. It creates, instead of using just 255 pings, it creates a beam angle correction for the entire track line and then applies it. 
So assuming that your track lines are you know, fairly heterogeneous, that they have lots of different, uh, that each track line has a combination of rock and sand uh, that you're experiencing through your whole survey, then the, the EGN tables will be nearly identical. Here is uh, now instead of having a single track line for the entire survey, I have one table per track line. Um, so like I said, it's kind of a compromise between um, beam angle correction, which works on just little angular sections, and then the whole survey version. And it's still extremely good at preserving this uh, data out here on the outside. So when should you use it? It's best for regional mosaics. It's excellent for heterogeneous seafloors like we're seeing here. Um, this is the recommended algorithm if you're going to be doing C4 characterization. It does have some drawbacks. It's sensitive to changes in sonar power and pulse length. So each time you change the power or pulse length, you're changing the seafloor or you're changing the presentation of the seafloor. Um, and EGN wants you to hold that stuff steady. So you'd have to make new tables for sections of your data where you change the power settings or pulse lengths. It also has a tendency to enhance noise. So if you have environmental noise, like uh, pitch and roll artifacts especially tend to get worse if you use EGN. You can, if you do uh, individual EGN tables, one per track line, you can kind of mitigate this first thing with power and pulse length changes. Um, so that's one reason you might want to do that. And it does, uh, I, it kind of compensates for some of the other problems that uh, large surveys see where they have drift. If you have a lot of area in the north area that has rocks and a lot of area in the south part that is uh, sandy, sometimes you'll see a little bit of drift. It's almost the same thing you're seeing with auto TVG, except instead of happening every 200 pings, it happens across the whole survey. Um, a few Questions that I get asked frequently is, can you combine more than one gain algorithm? And the answer is, yes, you can, but I don't recommend that you do it. Um, the statistical algorithms in particular are really designed to work by themselves. If you start stacking things on top of each other, they uh, it tends to just make everything muddy. The one exception to that is probably TVG. TVG is a fixed algorithm that's applied to every single uh, ping. It's applied exactly the same way. And so that one is safe to use, including with EGN. So you can use TBG with any of the other algorithms. Uh, what algorithm is best for target detection? I would probably go with auto TVG if that was what my main objective was, is to look for small targets on the seafloor. I would start with that. Um, however, your mosaics are not going to look good. They're, that is not the algorithm I'm going to use. The best one for mosaics is EGN. It's designed for that, and it does a very good job. In fact, I think EGN is probably our best general purpose algorithm. My usual recommendation to beginners in SonarWiz, start with EGN. If that doesn't look good for your purpose, then try uh, Auto TVG if that's what you're going for. Uh, should you ever use AGC? Um, I would only use AGC if your survey is being seriously compromised by motion of the fish. So if you've got very serious striping, and it's when you zoom out, it looks really awful, like zebra stripes or something like that. Then I would consider using AGC. Beam angle correction, for the most part, I think is obsolete. EGN does pretty much the same thing. Um, it's not quite as good as uh, beam angle correction on the Nader, but maybe we can fix EGN so that it does more of what EGN does. And just to kind of flip back through them again, so you can kind of see in comparison. And so here's TVG and automatic gain control. So this TVG works, this is the manual mode for TVG. And you can see it's, the geology is preserved. You can see nice definition there, but the edges of the lines show up more. It's not as good as EGN at removing that stuff because it's not doing a beam pattern correction, basically. Automatic gain control, within the track lines, it looks smooth as butter. It does a very good job of removing all of that noise, but I think it tends to over smooth things. You can see how the 
each track line has its own color palette um, because it's statistical. It doesn't have much, it has no memory at all. It, it works one ping at a time. And it tends to be sensitive to the mean value. So that's why the different, the mean value of the whole ping. And that's why the different track lines look different because we're going from rocky areas to sandy areas over here. Uh, automatic time varying gain does a better job with geology. It's got a little bit of a memory to it. So it's, I think it's a little smarter than AGC. Not quite as good at pulling out track noise. You can see there's a little bit of artifact here that looks like it might be some kind of heave artifact in there. Um, whereas the, the AGC kind of pulled it, almost completely pulled it out here. But uh, very good for target detection. It has nice shadows on the edges of our data. That's what you want if you're looking for targets. Beam angle correction, the naders practically disappear. You can see the difference here on the naders. And it doesn't do a half bad job over a small regional area. So this is why I think beam angle correction is pretty good for homogeneous environments. It worked well inside of this rocky area and it works well inside the sandy area. It tends to kind of blur things out when you cross from one type to another in a heterogeneous environment. Targets look nice and sharp. So it's definitely an option for target detection. The, the main drawback is it's just so slow to apply. So if you have a huge data set, it's not gonna look great. And then EGN, um, this one, I, I think it does the best job at preserving the geology. So here is a sandy patch in the middle of this rocky area. And here's another sandy patch over here. And these have, you can kind of see how with beam angle correction, that sandy patch sort of disappears, whereas it's back again here. So getting help, I still think the best way to get to get help from SonarWiz is to go to our website and go to our uh, support desk and we'd be happy to answer any questions. And I have almost used up all my time, but I can take a look here and see if there's any questions uh, that I can try to get answered real quick here. I gotta pull this. Uh, Lots of questions. I'm probably not gonna be able to answer all of this uh, while we're doing this. Okay. Um, can I apply a low frequency filter for side scan to reduce the noise? Um, there is you can there is a D-stripe filter um, that was designed for that purpose. I, I didn't have time to talk about the filters today. Uh, can I do the same procedure for backscatter data for multi-beam data? And the answer is yes, EGN and AGC have been implemented for multi-beam. Could you program the beam angle correction for nadir, but then cut it off after say five degrees? That's a really good idea, but the answer is not currently in SonarWiz. I've been looking at the beam angle correction for nadir, for nadir correction for a while and somehow get it integrated into EGN. Uh, do you mean calculated scalar by calculated delta and difference? I'm not sure exactly what we're talking about there. Um, is beam angle correction a theoretical version of EGN? Beam angle correction is an is a much older algorithm that was developed in the 1980s and 1990s, and EGN was just this idea that you know, we, why do we have these small little windows that are only 255 pings long when we could do the whole data set? That was really the impetus for doing that. So EGN kind of evolved from these earlier algorithms that um, had these limited windows and they tended to introduce problems when you switch geology. Since EGN is using data from all files to outliers and specific files, that is corrupted sections, um, cause problems or affect, uh, let's see, from the transducers problematic, have a chan chance to get applied to other files, potentially messing those files up. And the answer is yes. If you have large outliers in one file and you feed it into EGN, it can mess things up. Um, the solution to that is either increase the number of files that you're putting into EGN so that you have, a, the outlier doesn't have as much weight or uh, remove that line from the EGM building. Let's see. 
what is the gain that gives the best contrast to make a classification of the seabed EGN uh, would be that. Why does B-Mango correction need to work in blocks? Can it be implemented fluently like in AGC? Um, I guess uh, EGN is sort of a advanced version of B-Mango correction. It's doing a very similar job, but uh, it's an interesting idea. Why do we have to do it in blocks? And I think that answer is more historical. That's just the way it's always been done. Then. So um, that's about all the time I have um, to answer questions. I will. We have quite a few more questions. I'll try to send out uh, an email later today uh, with my answers to those questions. And uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>